Today, we have a returning guest, Dr. Bill Campbell, who is the director of the Performance in Physique Laboratory at the University of South Florida. He is the go-to guy when it comes to physique science, period. I think he literally, he, he kind of defines physique science. He is the original physique scientist. He is somebody that I've followed Man, for years and years and years, taking in all the information he puts out completely for free because he his main thing, again, he is in the lab. He is a professor at this college. He is doing research, but he is putting forth all this content for people like me to consume and use inside of my coaching. So uh, Bill has come on the show before. He is now a listener of our podcast. Him and I go back and forth via email and text, and he's somebody that I can call friend now, which is really, really cool and an honor to be associated with somebody like him. So I think you guys are going to get a ton out of this simply because he has a wealth of knowledge. And we dive into a handful of studies that he's been a part of, some of which that I was really excited to talk about. We discuss diet breaks on females. We discuss fast versus slow fat loss. We talk about muscle maintenance during fat loss phases and a whole lot more. So I think you guys are going to get, again, a ton out of this podcast. I always suggest grabbing a pad and a pen whenever Bill is on the mic because he just goes off and he gives so much content and information away. So um, if you love this podcast, do me a huge favor, head over to Instagram, take a screenshot of it, post on your story, tag both of us. That is Dr. Bill Campbell, PhD, and that is at Cody McBroom. We'll link both of those in the show notes of this episode so you can see the the usernames and tag us and we can share it on our story as well. Uh, If you like this podcast, make sure you are subscribed, whether you are on Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, and hit the notification button so you can get notified every time we drop a new episode. Without any further ado, Let's talk to the one and only, the physique scientist, Dr. Bill Campbell. All right, so round two with Dr. Bill Campbell. This is cool for me. Uh, I said this last time, man, but I've, I, I appreciate everything you do for the industry so much. And I've been following your work for longer than I can remember. And it's, uh, it's cool to be able to connect and, and discuss things on and off the podcast with you. It's, it's really, really cool for me. So I appreciate you taking the time and I'm excited to get into everything today. Um, before we do, uh, Everybody listening, go back and listen to part one with Bill if you want to. We, we talked about a specific research study, but you gave a little bit of your background, but I think it's always good to kind of give yourself an intro and just explain who you are to the audience that maybe hasn't heard part one or if there's new people listening. So if you want to just kind of explain to us who Bill Campbell is in a nutshell, that would be a great way for us to start. Sure, yeah. And before I do that, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be on here. I've Lauren Conlon was the first person who who made me aware of who you are and what you do, and that was a few short years ago. And and I think your your business has grown substantially just in those few years, from from what I can tell. So, and I appreciate what you do. Um, I don't have many podcasts on my phone, but yours is one of them. So I I appreciate what you do as well. Thank you, man. Um, as far as as far as who I am, a professor at the University of South Florida, I direct the Performance and Physique Enhancement Laboratory. I transitioned my career. I used to sell bug killer and weed killer, and then I didn't like that. I like lifting weights and <laughs> protein and creating. So I changed careers in my late 20s and very blessed to do that. And my research is designed to help people optimize their physiques within a maintainable lifestyle. So it's not necessarily for bodybuilders. It's not for obese people. It's for that group of people like me, probably like you. You're not planning on stepping on stage, but you want to look good. And pretty much everything I do in terms of study design and interpretation comes at it from that light. So as when we start talking about diet breaks and refeeds later, that's you're gonna I'm gonna keep referring back to from this perspective, this is, this is the, a perspective because a lot of people don't, they don't appreciate that perspective or they're interpreting it from a different lens. And depending on how you're interpreting it, you're going to come to different conclusions on these studies. Yeah. I think that's a really good point to make. And one of the reasons why I love what you do, because, and I shouldn't even say that most research is on either end, because it's really hard to get bodybuilders into studies. So there's not a ton on that. Um, But there's also not a ton on even resistance trained individuals. There's a lot of studies that just use sedentary obese individuals for diet studies. You always have to wonder if that plays a role. Um, But I think what I was talking to uh, Brandon about recently was that I think that the most important thing for coaches to do is to look at the principles that are found within a research study and, and then come to your own conclusions and use your own methods to implement those principles, right? Like I think that like people saw the Matador study and, and diet breaks became two weeks on two weeks off, 
Like that was the thing. And it's like, well, it could be two weeks on one week off, two weeks on uh, half, like four days off. It could be four weeks on and, uh, uh, you know, a few days off. Like you did the five day on two day off. And I think the principle is you're taking a break from the diet. What does this do? And how many different ways can we spin this? Um, and I think that's the important thing. And, and it is good to look at who's in the study. So you can try to relate it to your clients. Cause I think that plays a big role, but like you said, the people you study on is, is damn near perfect for a lot of the listeners to this podcast and for who we work with. That's for sure. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's me. It's, I design studies because like that five diet, two day refeed, I eat more food on the weekends. I'm like, all right, well, let's see what happens in a research setting. That, that's the Bill Campbell study, really. Yeah. Uh, I love it. And I think uh, another thing for people to, and I just want to mention this before we dive into the studies that we're going to talk about today. Um, there's always a lot of critiques. The more the longer Brandon's been on our team, the more research I've had to review with him and, and I've dug into stuff. And the more I've just been in the evidence-based community, the more you realize how many people just throw criticism at studies. And I don't think they understand how difficult it is to get a perfect study. I even see people saying, well, you should have done it this way. And it's like, you know how hard that would be to do it <laughs> that way? And like, you're not, and I never say those things because I'm not the one trying to find people to do it <laughs> or get funding for it, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, two things that I've learned. I haven't been on social media that long, but one thing I've learned is if you're going to be in the evidence, evidence-based evidence space, it's hard because your audience is intelligent. So if you say anything wrong, that audience is going to know it. And believe me, <laughs> they're quick to tell you. And the other thing, like you said, is, yeah, um, you should have done this. You should have done that. It's a lot of, a lot of I, I, when I come up with an idea for a study and we start to get the design, it's not until a year later at the earliest that that study's done. So a lot can change in that year where if you would have only known X, Y, or Z, you would have done this differently or that differently. So yeah, it's, you, uh, I would say, just like anybody, I, I don't know how much hate you get, but there's definitely a lot of criticism. Just you can't do anything right. But I guess that's science. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's fine. I posted something today. It was a video of me. Uh, it was a uh, it was basically like a drop set. And I was like, do you want to see what it actually looks like to take a set to failure? Because I think a lot of people, you know, oh, that's an RPE 10 that I did. And it's like, eh, I don't know if it was like RPE 10 is pretty brutal. So I, I posed one and one person was like, that technically wasn't failure because you didn't fall. Like you didn't literally like fall while you were doing it and not be able to finish. And I was like, okay, I should have been specific. There's, you know, absolute failure and technical failure. If I would have done another rep, it would have been a, like, literally, if I finished it, it would have been bad. I might've hurt my joints because my knees were just, I mean, I was at rep 40 something on these sissy squats, where it was like loaded, peel weights, loaded, unloaded. Like it was just, it was ridiculous. Wow. And, uh, it was actually like in this stuff, I don't very do very, I have a headache after I did it. Actually, it was funny, but. Um, what was the exercise? So it's a sissy squat machine, right? And uh, so my program called for a hack squat. I don't have a hack squat. So what I did is I took a trap bar. It's an open face trap bar. So the front yeah. doesn't have it. And I loaded the sissy squat uh, and I had 50 pounds on each side. So two 25s. And then I basically did like 10 ish reps, peeled to 25, 10 ish reps, peeled all the way and just did body weight for as many reps as I could. That's and brutal for that movement. Yeah, it was, my quads hurt bad. But it was just, this person was like arguing with me about what failure means. And I was like, hey, like the point of this post is to teach people like, you got to test yourself sometimes to actually be able to use an RPE scale. Otherwise you don't know what RPE 8 it really is. So, so I 100% get it. I had another one that was, I, I did a high carb is better for fat loss post. And somebody was, this is, uh, they're actually using language I, I don't think is appropriate publicly, but like, it's just saying stuff about how it, the study didn't make sense and it didn't account for this and that. But by the end of the comment, like some people get worked up about it. And I read his comments like, have you read the study? Cause like what you're saying is actually completely inaccurate. And then he had no, and then he switched his argument. So a lot of people that are doing it to you too, I'm sure don't really know or think you're going to comment back. And then when you comment back, like, Oh shit. Like, okay. yeah, I've, I've made it a point to, even though sometimes I don't, I, I feel like it. I just make it a point. I, I'm not going to ramp up things. I'm not Lane Norton. I'm not <laughs> whoever. I'm, I'm just happy you commented. And I, I, 
I go on from there. It's yeah. it keeps my it's better. It's just better for my personality to yeah do that. But again, sometimes I'm very tempted. And then I have to also think I'm I'm representing my students, I'm representing my university. I'm a Christian, so I'm representing Jesus. So it's like, oh, I've got to really I've got to restrain sometimes what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and and I could agree with everything you just said I'm the same way. I right now I don't I probably don't get as many as you. You have a bigger following and you're doing the studies. So a lot of what I talk about is very opinion based and you can argue my opinion, but it's opinion, not a fact. So when I do, I'll give them like one comment. And if it goes beyond one comment, I just stop. Cause I agree. I don't want to get into the weeds, but, um, but I'm sure like, like most things like the, the five day on two day off, there was a lot of criticism that some, like I even saw you responsible, like that makes sense. Like that's something to consider. And then other ones to me just didn't, I think they were reaching, but what I always try to do and I tell coaches to do um, this is the last thing I'll say, and then we can kind of dive into the actual study we're going to talk about. Look at what the researchers do and hear their interpretation and then find reviewers of the research and find their interpretation and then make your own interpretation. Because, you know, I see a lot of people read abstracts or they read the titles or even like they subscribe to mass research review, which I'm a huge fan of. And they'll just read like the conclusion or the bullet points. And I'm like, man, the gold is in that long middle section where it's their interpretations. Like, what do they think about it? What would they do differently? How do they apply this? What did they see? Because now you can see how their brain is really working. And that's how you get a good, clear explanation of what's going on. Because even I've been coaching for almost, almost 11 years, and I still will read a, like a PubMed study. And it's still kind of like uh, Egyptian to me. It's, it's, you know, it's hard to really fully understand until I hear what you thought about it afterwards. And then I ask Brandon about it. And then I go read whatever mass reviews on it. If they review the study and then I really, really understand it. And I think admitting that as a coach is first step, but two, it's like find the interpreters. They're the ones that are going to be able to explain it for you. Yeah. And I, I mean, how, coaches to, to, to craft out that time to actually, actually read studies in, a, you know, all the client inquiries, all of the, 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 you know, the business operations, I, I wouldn't know how a coach would even attempt. So I have a lot of respect for you. And like I, I we were talking about um, Dr. Roberts earlier, just what a, I, I really respect you for bringing somebody like him on your team to, to just, you know, you can, you can have faith that the science is covered and just in case you don't have all the time. So um, yeah, I, I really, the, the stuff that he does on his Instagram is just that the amount of time I'm like, wow. And I know when we were talking, I know he has like seven jobs, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> he, he drinks a lot of caffeine. I know that. <laughs> I'm sure he's, oh. it's, it's impressive from, from an, from a research perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so the, the first study we wanted to cover today is the diet break study. And uh, I think the best way to kind of tackle these would be kind of just rapid fire them. Like we don't have to, I don't want to rush anything can take our time, but I think it would just be cool to be like, okay, what kind of like what we were just talking about, what was the study? Uh, what were the findings and then kind of what your interpretation is. And then if I have a few questions, we can kind of just dive into the details. Um, and the first one is this diet break study, which I'm really excited about because to me, diet breaks has just been the most fascinating topic in the, like in nutrition, because it started out as something, uh, almost like a, <laughs> like a magic, like, you throw this diet break in and it stops diet, like dieting adaptations and it's going to reverse your hormonal issue. Like it's, it, it was like so good to be true. And to turns out it was too good to be true to an extent. Um, and there's just been this like ping pong going back and forth of different research studies, different conclusions. And, and I love the way that the research is going back and forth with it. It's been really cool. Um, so can you explain to us what your study that you did? Uh, I believe it was female dieters, correct? Well, if we're talking about the one that already that I already published, which was a diet refeed study, that one was males and females. Okay. We just we're just getting ready to submit another diet break study, which was more close to a the, the Matador study where we had two weeks. Um, I'm sorry, a week off. That one's not published yet, but we did present data on that last year, so I can talk about that. So when you're asking me about my diet break study, which you want me to talk about the, the one that we published, which what I would call a refeed, two-day carbohydrate refeed, or would you like me to talk about the one that we have coming out? Let's talk about the one coming out. We did, we did a pretty in-depth one about the 5-2. Um, yeah. That's what I always call it, the five days on, two days off. Um, so I'll yeah. link that in the show notes. You guys can listen to that. Um, really, really great podcast. That was pretty shortly after you published it. Um, 
So let's dive into this other one and just kind of give us what you can without obviously going beyond what you can yeah. tell us. No, I can give a lot because we presented this data as an abstract. Um, so the design of this was, well, the population was resistance trained females who were not overweight. So it was a fit population and it was a, one group did a six week diet. We reduced their calories by 25% and we made sure their protein was at two, I think it was either 1.8 or two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. The other group also dieted for six weeks, but after every two weeks, they took a one week diet break where we took their calories back to maintenance levels and their protein still stayed at one, I think it was 1.8 grams per kg. So protein was the same. The diet length was the same, but because of the diet breaks, the one group was in the study for eight weeks. So that was the difference. And by the way, this, their, all of their workouts were supervised in my lab. So there was no hedging or assumptions. We know exactly what they did, every rep, every set. We had them train to within two reps of failure on every set, except for the last set, we asked them to take it to what, what I define as technical failure, which means you cannot do another rep with good form. So we felt very good about the intensity. So what we found at the end of the study was a significant loss of body weight, significant loss of body fat. It was about two and a half pounds of body fat a complete re retention of muscle mass. So no muscle mass loss, but no differences between the diet break group and the group who did not take a diet break. So no differences. So kind of in contrast to the Matador study based on what they found. And you said that it was both groups were eight weeks or, or one was extended a little past eight weeks because... Yeah, so one group dieted for six straight weeks. So their total intervention was six weeks. The other group also dieted for six weeks. So same number of weeks of dieting, but because we inserted two one-week diet breaks, their total intervention was eight weeks. Got it, okay. Was there any other indicators besides fat loss and muscle retention that you guys were paying attention to or looking for? We also looked at metabolic rate that also didn't change at all. So one of the things that I think we are starting to dial in as an industry, and I can clearly say we're dialing it in with my, with my lab is in the, in this population who are lean people trying to lose more fat, we are getting to the point where we're doing that without any loss of muscle mass or without any loss of metabolic rate. Now, this happens to be our latest study, and I'd say it, it was nailed. I mean, you don't often lose 100% of your weight from body fat, and you don't often lose weight and, have, and not lose any of your metabolic rate. So we, we hit both of those thresholds. The other thing that we looked at was... Uh, it's called the, the eating inventory, which is basically a, a, a questionnaire about your um, eating psychology. One of those things was, it's termed disinhibition, which I hate that word because I never know what it means. But disinhibition basically means your propensity to overeat. Like you just don't care. You're just going to eat what anything and everything in sight. Now, it doesn't mean you did, but it means you have those feelings. So what we found was the group that took the diet breaks were, had a significantly improved suppression of that feeling of you know, uncontrollable hunger or you know, what the scale calls disinhibition. That went down over time in the diet break group. Those feelings actually increased over time. And that would be expected if you're dieting for six weeks, you're gonna probably get have those feelings that you want to, um, be, you know, you want to eat more and more, or just uncontrolled eating. So that increase. So that was the one difference that we found in our study. I think that that aligns. I don't know how much you've dug into Jackson's recent study, but I believe that aligns well with what they found as well with hunger and, and food focus and things like that. It's it's it seems like it's almost a mirror image of what they found. A little different population. Uh, he had a larger sample size, longer period of time. Ours was shorter. His, his study was better designed than ours on a lot of those variables, but the outcomes seemed to be fairly close. 
Did you guys look at any performance metrics? No, okay. no, we, we, we didn't do any one RM testing. Um, I know they, they, I, I believe he said he noticed, uh, and I haven't talked to him about the recent one, but I heard him talking about it and he said uh, they noticed a performance enhancement during the die breaks weeks from a muscular endurance, not a strength, but maybe you can do a little more volume, which would make sense. You're filling up glycogen. And if you guys maintain muscle, I would probably assume that you guys would have saw the same result if you, if you were watching that. Yeah. I, I, I let me just say, I wouldn't be surprised if we would have, uh, now the other question though, is how much muscular endurance do you lose in six weeks or halfway through the study? Yeah. Cause if you don't lose much, then you wouldn't really expect to see a difference between the groups. True. So there's a, um, I'll go into this consideration now, depending on how you look at the, let's just focus on, on, well, let's focus on, um, um, Jackson's study as well as mine. If you're looking at that through a bodybuilding lens and bodybuilders want to try to have improvements or efficiencies in fat loss, you're going to look at those studies. And I think you would come to, well, they're, they're worthless. Like they're not helping me lose more fat. They're not helping me retain more muscle. So why would I do that? So there's one interpretation, which I think is fine. If that's what you're looking for, it's not going to be beneficial. But if you are a, somebody like me or somebody like my subjects who are going to, let's say they have finals and they don't want to, they don't want to diet during a week of finals, they are going to go on vacation for a week. Your kid's birthday party, you have a three-day event planned around that, or you're just tired of dieting. I think it's highly valuable to know that you can take a break for a week or two, depending on the study. And you're not going to do any damage to your long-term fat loss outcome. Now, you do have the longer time, but I'm never going to argue with somebody about taking a longer time to lose body fat. In fact, that's my philosophy. Like, I think that's a better approach for lifestyle people. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to ever say this was worthless because I think you have to look at the a population that would find this extremely valuable, which is what most of most coaching profession would call the lifestyle client. Mm -hmm. I, and I would say at the very least, if there's absolutely no benefit to adding these in besides the simple fact that it's not going to harm you, like there's no, there's no negative. I think that's enough to say like for an average person who, you know, a bodybuilder, you tell them we're going to diet hard for 12 weeks. They'll be like, cool, let's do it. <laughs> you know, turn it on. But maybe, you know, somebody who has, I mean, even for me, like I, I have a kid, uh, I have a wife who doesn't have any interest in dieting, nor does she need to. And, uh, and she prefers me not to diet. So for me to have breaks that I can say, hey, like, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a diet break. And you know, you can get back to cooking in your Italian way, and, and I'll eat it and we'll be good. And she's happy. So that makes an influence on me, you know, so I think knowing that like, hey, I can do this every once in a while, and it's not gonna harm my results. That's enough for most people. Um, I'd be curious of your thoughts if if your study was longer than six weeks, if it was 12 weeks or 16 weeks or or however long, do you think that you would have still seen that uh, that preservation of the metabolic rate? Um, I mean, even muscle maintenance, I think, would be more likely. I, I was talking to Brandon recently, and I believe he said that most research says your metabolism starts to take a, a little bit of a dip during a diet after about three weeks. That's when it starts. You start to see a difference in it. So you, you pass that mark of saying like, well, we're definitely extending, you know, where that adaptation really starts to kick in um, by not even just the diet breaks, by doing all the things you're doing with protein and training and everything. But um, do you think it would have been slightly different if you extended it longer? Yeah, if anything, me metabolism and muscle mass would have gone down I, if it were longer. I think the, the most intriguing part, though, of our, our study length and our results, I, the only way that there is a utility for a diet break, the only way it's going to work is if you actually have negative adaptations from the diet, because otherwise a diet break isn't gonna, it's not, you know, a diet break, the way I understand it, it's kind of meant to solve the problem of a suppressed metabolism, potentially of stalled fat loss. So in, in, in our study, it was, the diet wasn't severe enough and it wasn't long enough to induce these negative adaptations. 
So there's really no utility for a diet break. So in a sense, our study was set up to fail to answer the question that we wanted it to. We should have been more aggressive, should have had a longer period of time if we really wanted to test the effectiveness of a diet break. I think for bodybuilders who do go into these extreme elongated diet periods, they're much, they're, there's much more likely for a benefit, but not apparently not for the lifestyle client for these, you know, taking a week or two off from diets. So, and again, we haven't published this yet, but this, this was all in our discussion. It's like, if you're, if a diet break's going to work, you better at least make sure that there is something for the diet break to address. And I don't think our study introduced an, a negative adaptation for it to address. There was nothing for it to help. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, so one thing I've been curious about, um, you know, I started seeing, I think the first people I saw doing this was the guys from 3DMJ uh, with prep athletes. And it was kind of like this pre, pre-comp diet, pre-prep diet, where it was like, hey, we're going to diet you for six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it was, moderately test things out, get you going. Then we're going to take a, a maintenance phase. You're spending a few, like two to three months at maintenance, taking a diet break. And then we're going to start your prep. And it made a lot of sense to me from a physiological standpoint of just kind of preparing your body, not overtaxing your body, not taking too long, even psych- psychologically. And, uh, but I never did that. Cause a lot of times I don't have that much time with a general person. Um, even if they do stay with us for six plus months, which they often do, they want to lose weight now. They don't, it's very hard to do that. But I went through a full year, actually, Eric Trexler, who I think, you know, was working with me and we did a, a year long bulk. Um, I gained a lot of weight and muscle. And then we transitioned to a cut. I think I spent three months gradually losing fat and weight and it was really productive, but business got crazy uh, in a good way. I was moving into a new home. There was some personal stuff I had to take care of that. It was like, I'm going to go to maintenance for a while. Stress is higher. Like this is not the best time to diet. So I actually went to a diet break and I spent two or three months there. And now I just picked it back up and things are going really well. And I was like, I accidentally did this like pre-comp diet and it's working fantastically. And I didn't gain any weight in the diet break period because I stopped the diet before it got really aggressive or, or like I was grinding or, or anything. So do you think there's utility in that? And, and to say like, Hey, let's like separate the, the, uh, the diets and then like make, take a longer diet break between, and maybe we'd actually see some reversal of these adaptations. Cause I think that's the big thing, right? We thought a diet break would reverse adaptations and everything coming out. It doesn't, but they're also such a short period of time. I mean, two weeks being the longest diet break study there is. Yeah. There, there was one other study kind of what I, what I refer to as the, uh, the original diet break study, which was by wing and Jeffrey. I think it was 2002. One of their arms had a six week diet break mm. in that study. And once again, at the end of the diet, period that was a 20 week um, intervention, they found no benefits to the diet break. But if you're going to take six weeks off and, and not have any harm. So there's this theme and I'll just say globally, the research would suggest diet breaks either help or they're never going to hurt. So again, no evidence that they're going to be harmful other than elongating the time that you're going to take to lose, lose the body fat. Uh, and again, bodybuilders might not have that luxury. Lifestyle clients, I, if I'm working with them, I would say, let's plan this in. So that's, yeah, I, I think there is utility to what you suggested. I think that makes sense. Um, and just a, a side note, um, Dr. Trexler, he's my data analyst. So he's the one, an, he's analyzing all of our data on this diet break study. He's um, he's very involved in, 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 in my lab in terms of the, the statistics. I've actually heard from multiple people that he's like the statistics guy. Like he's really good with that stuff. Yeah. It, he's, he's on a different level. He's, he's one of the premier. And I was so happy when he agreed to, to kind of do that role or yeah, take on that role for me. Cause it's, you know, if you get somebody with statistics, they can look at a set of data and they can see 29 things with it that I'm only seeing like three. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's nice. And I, I need to make this statement. He's so ethical. He's, um, that's another thing you, you got with, I mean, you might not know this, but there are people who try to massage the data. They try to, you know, they want to have this kind of outcome. Um, so you got to have people you trust in that role. And I, I, I really respect him for, he doesn't care what the, 
what the data is. He's going to interpret it and it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very, very honest person from what, like, I mean, I spent a year working with him and just our conversations and questions and things he helped me with outside of coaching is just like, he introduced me to Brandon. So yeah, he's really, really good guy. Um, but cool. That makes sense. I think that, uh, for me, like the, the last thing I would love your opinion on with the diet breaks is in my experience using them when I've seen really good results from them, it's typically, and this is when I often use them and it could be just a psychological thing kind of rubbing off in these other areas, or maybe it's completely psychological for the longest time. I thought it was more hormonal or even maybe from a cortisol perspective, but it was with really high stress individuals. I'd get like a 35 year old mom who was also working a job and she did CrossFit five days a week and she's trying to lose fat and diet. And I'm like, your training intensity is through the roof. Your life intensity is through the roof. You're barely getting sleep. Like a diet is not going to be a great thing for you. So, you know, reversing or getting remains that, that stuff, but then going into a diet and using diet breaks more regularly always worked really well with these individuals. And to me, it was always like, well, this makes sense. They're have chronically elevated cortisol. They're always stressed and have all these stressors. So if we give them a bunch of carbs, you know, every few weeks, and maybe we're just kind of blunting that stress response and that's helping. Um, we, I know there's no, I mean, it'd be hard to do it. There's no studies testing diet breaks on 35 year old busy moms who cross it, you know, but <laughs> my point being is, is that even something that's like makes sense rationally or, or like, what do you think is going on there? Is it just placebo psychologically? So I, I, my opinion on that is not based on research because I, I don't, I'm not aware of research that's looked at that, but the coaches that I respect who are, who are looking at blood work and exactly just line up with what you said, they're the, the people that I respect in this space say exactly what you said. If stress is high and the assumption is that cortisol levels are high, like fasting cortisol, cortisol throughout the day, if it's high, if you, that is a blunt for fat loss. So I, what I've seen the, the industry do over time is address that through sleep, stress management. And then what they're telling me is fat starts coming off again, not even making other changes, just trying to address that. Mm -hmm. So my opinion, not based on research, is I think there's a lot of utility to that because this is what the people in the trenches are doing and seeing and um, now a few of them have supplements that they sell. So maybe they're, they potentially could be biased, but other coaches have nothing to gain from their observations or how they're coaching their clients. So it's, I think there's a lot of utility there. Um, it's, I mean, cortisol and, and, and whenever you get into hormones, it just gets expensive for somebody like me because my studies generally aren't funded. So it's, it's something I would love to research but you've got to find the people who have the high stress and you might go through a lot of subjects before you get there. So I, I think the way to probably do that for me in the future is case studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of what I'm basing off of. It's just case studies that I've used. Um, but it's always hard to explain because clients will ask what's going on. And hypothetically, I think I know what's going on, but I don't have research to back it up. So I'm careful with exactly what I say, because I don't want them to think it's, it's like a magic pill that's always going to work. But I, you know, to me, yeah. it's been, if we can kind of control your cortisol levels, your stress levels, and for some people doing that and adding carbs stuff, it's going to make you sleep better. That's going to, it's kind of this domino effect, you know, um, but it's, but you can base, go ahead. you can base your, um, your conversation now with experience, right? Like, Hey, there's no research on this, but my experience with other clients has told me blah, blah, blah. And that's, uh, I, I'm a scientist and I'm going to put my experience above the science sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I love hearing that. I love hearing that from you, man. That, that means a lot. And that's really, it's good hearing that from you because I think I've always thought evidence-based means research and experience put together. And a lot of people use it as like, they think it's just research, but I, but I find that coaches like myself working with researchers like you are able to really come up with some good stuff for people because of that. Yeah. And, and research, I mean, let's be real. There's researchers doing resistance training research that don't even lift weights. Like it's, and the study designs, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, now again, there's other people that are doing great work, but just because it's a published study, it, it's, and even my stuff, there's some, mis I've made mistakes. I'm hopefully I'm getting better over time. I, I can tell you my, 
statistical analysis is much better with Dr. Trexler. So, um, yeah, for I, I, I think the, the way I internalize this is you have the polar extremes. You have coaches who are say they're evidence based and they're going to do what you said earlier. Two weeks on, two weeks off. That's what Matador did. Research is going to do a blunt force differentiation of one variable. And that doesn't mean that's the optimal variable. That just means that's how they have to do the study so they can possibly detect the difference. Yeah. Then on the other end, you have the coach who could care less about the science. And I've seen this a thousand times, but what they've seen a thousand times will work um, every single time. And it wasn't because of this particular thing that they think it was. So yeah, it's gotta be, a, uh, I, I think the science should give you the guidelines to make decisions. And then you refine the guidelines with your coaching experience. Well said. I love that last part you put in about coaches just using experience. They do something a million times and it, it's, it's because of an indirect thing that they have no idea or they're not realizing is going on. And I've had that conversation with many people that come on board or ask questions on Instagram. I had a coach once upon a time that did so-and-so and this, and like they said, it's because of this. And I was like, it probably worked because of this, which triggered this and then this. A lot of times it's like, cause it swings you right back to you're in a calorie deficit <laughs> or you're doing enough volume. That's not really like a crazy thing that they think it is. Um, so it, it's, it's a good thing you pointed that out. Uh, I, I do want to make sure that I'm, I'm using my time wisely. So let's dive into the flex flexible dieting study. Cause this is a really cool study. Um, I've used as a reference point in my content and with my clients many times um, we had Lauren come on. I mean, it was probably well over a year ago at this point to talk about it, but I'd love for you to kind of give your take on it and what the study was, especially because we just had Dr. Joe Klimzenski and the whole thing was about kind of like the origin story of flexible dieting with him, which was really cool. But um, fill us in on, on what this study was and what you guys were looking for. Yeah, so this study was when Lauren was a master's student and this was her research project. So she did all of the, I mean, she had, you know, obviously I had input, Lane Norton had some input, but this was her brainchild. And it's been sitting on my desk for a while. So this study is now under review. We're working on revisions. I imagine this study will be published sometime in the summer months, early summer of 2021. It's not even published. So everybody, what's that? It's not published. No, no, it's not published yet. How long? How uh, long is it? Is this? Has there been two then, or is this? this no, one? we we presented the data as an abstract, so we can talk about all the details and all of that. Um, we submitted it for publication last year. Actually, no, it was probably towards the end of 2019, <laughs> and it didn't get rejected. It just had too many suggested reviews that I wasn't willing to make. So I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then the COVID thing hit and I had to totally upend my life in terms of what my research priorities were. So that sat on my desk, but now again, yeah, so it, it is not published yet. So it will be, I'm optimistic with the reviews that we've received that it will be published in a few months. Wow. Uh, other than in an abstract. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good example though of, of sometimes it can take a long time for a study to come out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so most people, I think, in this space would say, hey, flexible dieting, it works. It's, you know, it's a good alternative. And you can't really point to a study on it. Well, that once we get this published, that'll change. And, and the big take home message is whether you do a, a flexible dieting approach or you have a rigid or a, like, say, a meal plan approach, both work. So what I like to say is if you do a, a flexible dieting approach, it's no better and it's no worse. But in my life, it's a thousand times. I love having options. I love educating people. I mean, I'm sure you've done this probably thousands of times. You, you have a new client who thinks good food, bad food, or I can't have that. And, and then they start to realize, whoa, I, <laughs> there aren't rules. It's like, no, there's principles about total caloric intake and probably some benefits to higher protein intake. But yeah, you don't have to look at X, Y, or Z as off limits. Uh, so I, th this study will, will make that argument. Um, it's a valid option, no better or no worse than, than another option. But if, if the question is, is it better to have choices? Well, then there's a clear benefit. 
And so that's that's what we're going to suggest, or that's what we're going to present. Um, just some interesting findings were. After, uh, it was a ten week diet phase, no differences in weight loss, no different fat loss, no differences in retention. I, I'm trying to remember. I, I look at my studies and I can't remember which one's which. There was definitely a significant loss of fat, um, probably a little bit of muscle mass loss. But what we also designed was after the 10 week diet phase, we had 10 weeks of allowing the subjects to do whatever they wanted. They could continue dieting, they could uh, switch diets. So it wasn't controlled at all. And for some reason, the group that was in the flexible dieting group for the first 10 weeks, they gained significantly more muscle mass in the following 10 weeks. Now, I am not going to say that flexible dieting causes more muscle mass because it didn't. They weren't dieting or they weren't doing anything planned during that period of time. But the fact remains for the 10 weeks prior to that, they were doing a flexible dieting approach. And the group that was doing the rigid diet did not have a significant increase in muscle mass. So what are some reasons? It's hard to say. We first thing we checked was protein intake. That was the, there was no differences. We looked at caloric intake. There were no differences. We looked at resistance training volume. There were no differences. Now, this is one of the few studies that we've done that we didn't supervise the workout. So we don't have the controls that we've had in my other research. The, the one area that we were able to hypothesize, and this is clearly hypothesis, if stress levels are high, there is research to suggest that you don't adapt well to your resistance training program. So is it possible that the people in the rigid diet had higher levels of stress because they kept having to eat the same things every day for 10 weeks? And then for a period of time after that, they were still stressed. That's the only hypothesis we have. And that's a reach, but something, something was interesting. Uh, my, you kind of started saying, uh, debunking what I'm about to say, but I don't, I'd be curious too, because uh, you, you talked about principles and, and I love this quote, um, methods are many, principles are few, methods often change, principles never do. So high protein calories, that's a principle, right? Meal plan, flexible dieting, those are methods. But I think that when you do a flexible dieting approach, it teaches you the principle a little bit better than a meal plan. You know, if I hand you a meal plan, you just eat what it says on the paper. If I have to get you to flexible diet, I got to tell you, what protein you're hitting. And now, now I'm curious, well, why am I eating this much protein? What's the, like, what's the benefit and how do I do it? And so maybe adherence to those principles was actually better. And you can't really detect that unless it's a metabolic ward, right? Because you're just basing off what you see. Um, but after the diet, maybe those principles stayed in place a little bit better with the flexible dieters, like the protein and the calories better than what we can see. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and maybe that discipline, again, we didn't track the, one thing we don't know is the intensity of the lifts. So there's something else that, that maybe they did, but that's a good point. Maybe they developed the skill of just um, decision-making uh, control, because I, I don't, if you're given a meal plan, I, I, I'm going to say, I don't think you learn anything after that. You're, you're as ignorant as you were. I mean, if there's any skill, I guess you're getting, you're, you, you get the skill of learning to deal with hunger if you're on a diet. Other than that, meal plans, I, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think. Yeah, you you come out of that a, a more educated dieter. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't think so. I think, in my experience, the people who do best with meal plans are people like me. Like I'm, I just started to cut. I 100% created a meal plan based off of where my macros need to be. So if I do need flexibility, like this weekend's Easter, my that's like my wife's biggest holiday, like for her family and everything. So I'm eating something for Easter. So that's a flexible day where I, I, at least I know why the meal plan is the way it is. Right. And I think for me, it's just, I'm busy and I, and I like to know what I'm eating and I just repeat it throughout the week weekends. It's a little bit flexible. So meal plans kind of work better for somebody like me, but I think the point with that is, is I know the principles so well because I do this for a living that it's a little bit easier. And most people we see doing meal plans, they're bodybuilders, right? That's yeah. a completely different scenario. So I think saying one works better than the other is it's completely contextual, right? Who, who are we talking about here? And I think your study did a good job at showing that 
there's no difference. Um, I, I think there was one other, and you might be more familiar with this. I want to say I saw it in Mass Research View, so I, I don't know who, who the authors of the study were, but they did something similar, and I, I want to say that they saw uh, improved health as a very general statement, but I can't remember what the markers were, but with a flexible approach because there was more diversity in the diet so that people actually did get more variety of fruits and vegetables and things like that with a flexible approach. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I mean, if, the, if, if that's what they're choosing, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm not aware of that study, but I, I tend not to, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy health. I like health. I just don't study health. I'm, I'm very much on the, it's all about physique and metabolism. Um, yeah. but that, that makes sense. And I got to think in that study, there probably, it probably wasn't a resistance training population. Um, I think I would have come across it if it were. How, how would you even define flexible dieting? You know, cause I think that's, that's on a whole nother topic. And it, you know, some people think it's protein shakes. Well, I, I, I use a, if, if I were to say, do I have a system? My system is called protein anchored flexible dieting. And what that means is I'm, we're going to set your protein and you're going to hit that value. And then the rest of your calories, whatever you want, but you've got to hit your protein. Again, this is for exactly what we talked about earlier. This is for people who want to optimize their physiques within a maintainable lifestyle. Protein anchored, I would suggest a, a, a gram per pound of body weight. But if you want to, if, if that's, if you struggle, let's, you know, let's get you more than what you otherwise would without me helping you. Um, I would su suggest not going less than 0.75 grams per pound or 1.6 grams per kg. So flexible dieting, at least the way I see it under this protein anchored flexible dieting is you hit your protein and don't go over your calories. Every other decision you work with, educate yourself on what are carbs, educate yourself on what protein is, educate yourself on what fats are. So I, I hope that answers your question. That's how I define it. That's my, that's the system that I use for myself. Yeah, I, th I think at the end of the day, it's more simple than people make it. Um, mine's pretty similar. I, I kind of have like a checklist, like people will ask like, what's flexible? I'm like, did you hit your protein? Yeah. Are you getting fiber? Yeah. Did you get like a couple servings of greens or fruits, you know, some actual real food? Yeah. Do whatever you want with the rest, you know? So kind of like a, a checklist just because some people do take it out of hand. Obviously I think you, you got to make sure people aren't like, if I talk to somebody and they're like, Oh, I haven't had a vegetable in six weeks. I'm like, Oh, well, it's probably not the best decision. <laughs> we might want some greens, but, um, but no, I think, I think it, it, it also reminds people that, you know, obesity and body fat is one of the leading causes for poor health versus, you know, I don't care how much vitamins and minerals you get. Like if you're, if you're overweight, you got a health problem and that's going to be a risk factor. Right. Yes. Now there is a small percentage of obese who are still metabolically healthy. So you're going to hear that pushback. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I think right, we're living in a time now where the impression is that that's the norm and that's not the norm. It does yeah. exist, but it's, it's, it's the exception. Yeah. I think, uh, normal and optimal are two different things. Right. And I think, Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the thing people got to realize. So, um, I think, uh, so there's two more things I want to kind of briefly cover before we wrap this up. Uh, and, and I know you can't like dive too deep into this one, but I'd really just love to hear your opinion overall, like with, what you've dug into personally and then what you've seen. And then obviously you talk to so many different coaches and what they do. Um, but this whole like battle, it's not really a battle, but just the, the rapid versus slow fat loss, you know, like if you have to choose one, can you choose one or is it, and it depends. And if it is like, why does it depends on the scenario? Yeah. So back to the, just the, the, what do you learn? I think if somebody goes on a, a rapid fat loss, they're trying to just do a, a crash diet. They're not, they're, they probably are going to be successful as long as they can adhere to that, but they're not really picking up any habits that will be part of their continuing lifestyle. So that's a, that's a concern I have where if you take a elongated or a, a long game approach, you're, in my opinion, and again, I don't study the psychology, I don't study habits, but I, I think that you are likely going to be able to develop habits that will stick with you. So I'm sure you've, you probably use this phrase, but do you, is what you're doing today, do you see yourself doing that six months from now and a year yeah. from now? 
and crash diets, the answer, if anybody's going to be honest, the answer is always going to be no, if we're going to be honest. Because if it's not, if it's not, you would be dead. You can't perpetually be in a crash diet because you would starve to death after a period of time. The, my, so my general approach is don't be in a hurry to lose fat. Take it easy, take it slow. I, I, I won't argue, I won't talk somebody into going faster. Now, once again, are we talking about a competitive bodybuilder who's stepping on stage in eight weeks? No, it's a different population. I'm talking about everybody else. That being said, I can appreciate that people don't want to go slow. And in that case, and sometimes I don't want to go slow. In that case, my question changes to, okay, and this is kind of what's guiding my research lab right now. How much fat can we take off of the human body and as quickly as possible without causing damage. And I'm defining damage is without losing muscle mass, because this is about physique after all, and without suppressing your metabolism. Because if you suppress your metabolism, you're just setting yourself up to gain that weight back when you're done dieting. So I, I'm liking this question. So we designed a study pre-COVID, then it got shut down in COVID, and then we just, and then we finished the end of this study last fall, so actually still in a COVID world, we just had to do it remotely with people. And the idea of that study was, what we're saying is how aggressive can we be and not cause damage? So what we did was we gave people a 37 and a half percent caloric restricted diet prescription. So not quite 40, but more than 35. So 37.5% for only two weeks. We had a two week maintenance period and a two week rapid, I don't know if you'd call that a crash diet or a severe diet. Some people would, some people wouldn't. And what I can share, because we didn't publish this yet, is in those two weeks with a prescribed 37.5% caloric restricted diet, there was a significant suppression of metabolic rate. It was six, about a 6% reduction. So to that, we would say, okay, well, what if we give them high protein? Will that help? We did give them high protein. They were prescribed to eat a gram per pound or 2.2 grams per kg for our international audience. So even the protein didn't help spare the, the, the suppression of metabolic rate. Then the other thing that I always turn to is, well, you got to have them resistance train because that will help preserve muscle mass. And if you preserve muscle mass, that will help preserve metabolic rate. We did have them resistance train. We had them resistance train in my lab for the first half of the study before COVID where we could watch everything. And once again, that still didn't, that didn't help preserve metabolic rate. Now I didn't look at the muscle mass yet. I'm going to, I'm pretty confident that there was a significant loss in muscle mass. So this tells me, even when you do everything right with protein intake and resistance training, if the caloric deficit gets too severe, you, you can't, you can't out hack that at some point you're going to have negative adaptations. I love that. And that doesn't even account for the psychological difficulty yeah. to stick to a more aggressive diet. So that's huge. I, you know, when you were saying, uh, and I have used this many times, if you can't see yourself following this for six months or later on, then it's not the right diet for you. Um, I almost said the only caveat there would be a bodybuilder because they go into prep knowing that they're not going to do this forever. But even with what you're saying, unless you do see that there was absolutely zero muscle loss, like it's probably not even the best thing for them because most bodybuilders plan on having an off season to build more muscle. So if you're taking 10 steps back, not literally, but taking a step back muscular wise, now half your off season is playing catch up, you know? Um, so that even is an argument to make even a prep for that competitor longer. It's almost like, slower is better across the board yeah and clearly i mean i'm old enough to have seen um the progression of the natural bodybuilding space that that total uh contest prep has changed it's okay. very typical now to see a 20 week 24 week 32 week uh, that that when, again i when i used to bodybuild when i was younger it, 16 weeks was considered long mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago so the industry has changed a lot or the, that, that part of the fitness space 
um, for natural competitors, at least in my opinion, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Uh, when I did my competition, I've only done one and I did it, uh, way back years ago and I purchased a 12 week prep. (laughs) And, And so it was exactly what you're saying. It was 12 weeks, shotgun approach, get right to it. I got shredded, but it, I definitely rebounded afterwards. Um, <laughs> was not ready. Did I. <laughs> so, um, and funny enough, it was a meal plan, which was harder to adhere to afterwards. Cause I didn't, back then I didn't understand nutrition like I did now. So I didn't know the principles actually I'm thankful for it. It's funny enough that process of just grinding, getting on stage and then gaining a bunch of weight back pushed me to start researching reverse dieting and trying to figure out basically what do I do after gaining weight after a prep. And I found Lane Norton, Dr. Joe and Eric Helms. And I just went down a rabbit hole. And then that's where like, I was like, I'm going to go get certified. And I started getting certification and it was just like the snowball. So now I look back and I'm like, thank God for that. But at the time it was miserable. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, since you mentioned the word reverse diet, let me put out a scenario to you and get your, get your opinion. Last year, I was as lean as I've been in probably the last 10 years. So COVID treated me great in the sense that I beefed up my garage gym and I, I was saving an hour a day of commuting. So I, I was able to put that time into my fitness. Mm-hmm. And I got, for me, lean, um, I don't know, maybe a percent, maybe 12%. And I dieted down to that. And then I did a reverse diet. So I plan on publishing a case study on this. And then, you know, I just, it was about an average of 5% per week of increasing calories. And I wanted to see, and I I won't share what happened. um, Because I don't even, I mean, I do know what happened, but I don't, I I, I don't know the, um, what people expect to happen, but I know I want it to happen. I wanted to get to like 4,000 calories of food and not be gaining fat. (laughs) I can say that didn't happen. Uh, My maintenance calories is usually around 2,900. Do you think that you have to get really lean shredded in order for a reverse diet to, to have that kind of a, uh, of an outcome or, I mean, for me, it was relatively, again, I'm in my mid forties. So me being 12%, maybe like a 25 year old being at 8%. In my experience, I think, you know, when the recovery diet came out from 3DMJ, they started talking about that. I think a lot of people, even myself were like, oh shit, you shouldn't reverse that slow because you're going to have all these issues. But when you work with everyday people, like the lean, the level of leanness, like a true 12%, which we know is, is different than somebody using a handheld thing. And they, you know, think they're leaner than they are, but well, yeah, and, my- and mine was um, ultrasound, and I also did a seven, uh, eight site multi BIA multi frequency. So, so ultrasound, yeah, I feel good about my numbers. Yeah, ultrasound is like as as good as you're gonna get. Um, most people that I work with, we don't even test body fat because it's just it's so inaccurate for the the utilities that they can use. But for somebody, in my opinion, that is the average person that gets that lean, which is pretty damn lean. I've seen, I've had really good success with taking a babied approach of like slowly inching calories up and keeping them pretty lean. And the reason for that is when we get to that, that level of leanness and I ask them, how are you feeling? And we look at, you know, sleep, mood, cravings, hunger, stress, all these things. The biggest thing is like, I'm just hungry. I just want some more food. Whereas if I put somebody on stage, which I've done many times, it's stress, it's motivation, it's mood, it's cravings, it's sleep, it's many things. And that's where I'm like, okay, we can't baby this process because you're in a healthy state. I mean, you're shredded for stage. So let's get you up quicker, put a little bit of fat on and then start climbing up. And I think that's a really good approach that 3DMJ popularized for competitors. But for everyday individuals, I've found amazing results of doing it exactly how you said. Now, as far as how far they get, I usually find that we're still like, I've kind of like, I don't know if this is uh, the right term used, but I've, I kind of call it a maintenance range. So I kind of find this area where they were, and it might be in the middle, and we might surpass that a little bit. But I found there's usually like a threshold where you just can't get them past that unless their neat picks up so much that you, this whole like G flux or eat more, move more theory kind of picks up with it. But even that goes to an extent, like, you know, like, unless you're a professional dog walker, I mean, your, your, step, your steps aren't going that high. Um, so I have surpassed people's previous maintenance while keeping them pretty lean, but I've also noticed their volume increase, their, their, their movement increase, but there's still that point where I feel like now we're just, we're competing to see how high we can get, or there's diminishing returns kind of thing. 
that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, and then one thing I liked, and I had never done this before every week, it, that 5% was like a, oh, that's another treat. Like, yes, I get, you know, it was very exciting week after week. Um, I, I'll never forget that. It was, it, it, I like that. And I think general pop, if they diet and they get lean, they want to stay lean for a long, you know, I, I get a bodybuilder. It's not about staying lean in the off season. You got to put on as much muscle mass as you can. But for people who don't care about that, I think the reverse diet is a, a better approach if they want to have a certain look for a longer period of time. So that, that's kind of my take on it. I would, I would hundred percent agree. I think, I think the, the difference between bodybuilding in gem pop it's just it's it's so different that you have to separate them and the same type of reverse diet can't be applied on both ends and i think i also think there's value in looking at your body like a science project which not everybody does because that excitement and the adherence to it is probably increased because you're fascinated of like usually people get done with the diet and they're like Fuck, now i gotta reverse like and it's hard for them to stick to it because they just want more Whereas people like us, it's like, cool, now I get to reverse. This is like a completely different journey and project. Like, let's see what the end result is and, you know, how I feel and my training. And even if you end up feeling like shit and your training drops and it's a bad result, you're still like, well, I learned a lot. And <laughs> the average person doesn't think that. So I, so I do think there's value in kind of looking at it from that approach too, from, from a consistency perspective. Yes. Yeah. Hey, and just while it's on my mind, I was just thinking, I, I, I think you were, this was one of your prior podcasts. It, it had a big impact on me. Was it, it was it the one where you said you were into these morning routines, but you're finding yourself having to get up like 90 minutes or an hour before to do all of these machinations to do this in very cohesive and strategic and systematic morning routine. And you got to the point where I just going to sleep that extra hour. Is that, do you remember? Yeah. I think I called it a uh, fuck the 5am club was the title. Yes. yes. I love to hear it because I, you know, I struggle with, and I have a morning routine, but it only takes me like three minutes. <laughs> it's very consistent, but that made a lot of sense. Like if, if, if sleep's important, you're going to sacrifice that for all, for this, you know, this rabbit hole of, I got to do this. I got to, I think, yeah, you said I think maybe flossing came into it and <laughs> some people are going to go jump in the ice bath because they have to do that right at, you know, at 5 30 AM. So anyway, I love to hear that perspective. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I don't study that stuff, Yeah, but I'm, I'm intrigued by it. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm as an entrepreneur, that kind of stuff. I'm always, I've always been really interested in that. And I listen to a lot of interviews of CEOs and entrepreneurs and business owners that are like just trying to do everything they can to produce at the highest level. And it's always interesting hearing what everybody says, but like even little things like meditation, that was, I didn't start meditating until I heard so many successful people say that they meditate. And finally I was like, okay, like I'm going to do this. But at the time it was like, it has to be in your morning routine. And then after a while I was like, well, why don't I just do it at lunch? Like, why do I have to do it in the morning? Like I just, the point is doing it enough to where you're just creating calmness and you can, you know, I always say it's, it's to help you respond versus react to situations. So I moved that. And then it was like, so now my morning routine is I chug a greens drink, not because greens powders are like some special supplement, but it just kind of mentally starts my day with like health. And I like that. I read and journal for 20, 30 minutes. And I'm done. And then it's just like, let's eat and work. And then I'm like you said, I get that extra hour, hour and a half of sleep and I'm way more productive because I'm well rested <laughs> rather than yeah. going through this sequence. Yep. Yep. I, I, I think that kind of forced me to say, yes, I'm not going to feel bad about trying to sleep in for that extra 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. rather than you know doing x y or z so yeah one of the things i used to do was i used to do whether it was a walk or a run you know within i used to you know, literally set my stopwatch by within eight minutes i want to be out the door and i'm like no i my best time to work is pretty much when i get up so i've i've learned to push back that to like 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock because i'm sacrificing what i think is my better work time for cardio which i don't enjoy anyway yeah I didn't, I thought it was working against me actually. Yeah. And you kind of gave me the confidence to say, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I love that. It was cool to hear that you, you were listening to that. And I got a lot of good responses of people saying that they were like, God, I feel guilty when I sleep until seven. I'm like, why? I mean, if it works with your schedule, why not? Like, um, I still wake up fairly early, but for me, my most productive content hours are early in the morning while my daughter and wife are asleep before I go to the office. So I love being able to 
wake up rested, have coffee and get right into creating things, you know, and I couldn't do that when I was, I would the same thing. I would wake up, I'd have to go on this walk and then I would meditate and then I would journal. The journaling would had to be specific. It was just like all these things. It's just like, they're all great principles and practices, but they don't need to be right away. So, um, but that's really cool, man. Uh, I, I'm not going to dive into the training things. I think that could be, honestly, we could talk about volume, intensity, and frequency for yeah, we'll do that next time. Itself. Yeah, we'll do that next time. And hopefully we'll be able to cover um, some of the other stuff you're coming out with that we weren't able to discuss today because I'm excited about those. Um, but real quick, before we hang up on this, tell everybody where they can find you so we can put all that in the show notes. You got a great Instagram where you put a ton of content out. Yeah, that's the only place they can find me. It's at Bill Campbell PhD. And basically what I do there is a lot of uh, true, false, multiple choice. I'm a professor, so I, I give exams. So pretty much I try to give a, a test question every day about something related to physique or sports nutrition or exercise science somewhere in that realm. Yeah. It's a great, great source of content. And um, if you enjoyed this one, guys, just literally Google search or YouTube search uh, or I on iTunes, Dr. Bill Campbell, there's a ton of interviews with him talking about a bunch of different things in the physique science world. So if you want to just go on a binge of listening to physique science stuff, you can type his name in and you'll find a ton of interviews with him. So, um, but man, thank you again for your time. It's always great. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely do this again. Yeah. Thank you.